Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover, in which we are, of course, using the second West Russian war mod for this campaign. But I did ask you guys yesterday whether we should go do Russia must chart its own destiny versus three nations can only endure in this world if we are all united. And overall, there's a ton of support for both sides. So I figured, as some of you guys did suggest, why don't we do both? And this is why this is episode is called uh, 6A. So there'll be 6A for this one and 6B for the next one. So for this one, even though some people want me to do the CSTO first, let's go ahead and do the, and try to join the OFN, align with the OFN. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, the Americans have done everything possible to assist the people of Russia in the darkest hour. From the West Russian War to the Reunification Wars and the Second West Russian War, the Americans have been uh, by our side every step of the way. We should repay the Americans for all their troubles over those recent decades by making an effort to, rejo to join the OFN and aligning ourselves with the U.S. beyond trade agreements. The two superpowers united as one will be unstoppable. Got some more comments to go through, but grant the military access. Granted, the U.S. military basing routes in Eastern Europe would not only give the Americans a, strate a strategically power position of the Reich, but will also improve the relations between the Federation and the U.S. of A. Having the forces of the OFN assisting in guarding over Western borders, ensuring that the Black Stain and the Einheit's back will never encroach upon Occupy Russian soil ever again. Nice. How, how much can we cut down that way? Not bad. But the first day in Washington, even though we will have to use constant commands for more uh, political power, but oh well. It was a drizzling day in D.C. But the gloomy greatness of the sky was filled with the strong energy of the National Airport. A special jet was making its way to the landing strip, and a crowd of reporters from NBC to Associated Press and beyond anxiously awaited for the Russian president to exit to ask questions. The reporters had endless questions to ask, foreign alliances, German speeches, and future of Russia on the global stage. The doors of the jet steadily opened. The reporters were filled with anticipation, and as the stairs were rolled, a security detachment soon emerged. Then, a lonely, a lone man of average height, dark brown hair, and blue eyes followed. That little Vasily Shukchin had ignored the mild coolness in the air and the rain dripping onto his hair to inspect the airport for a short moment. It was clean and orderly and filled with the sounds of transport and commerce. With a sparkling Potomac to the east of the airport, a feature that he saw as a jet landed cleanly on the smooth paved ground, it truly reminded him of Novosibirsk and Bonal, his home. But there was no time for him to reminisce as this, and Vasily faced the media representatives and waved to them as if they were his friends, but he didn't expect them to search forwards. The four reporters flooded with questions, bumping, shoving, and pointing microphones near him as Shukshin tried to address them one by one, but it became hopeless and he was quickly escorted into his designated car, in the car. Shukshin had a moment of peace. He knew the media would be there, but not an entire army of reporters. The media are real vultures, aren't they? The chauffeur chuckled as he continued to drive safely out of the airport. Shukshin had no comment and just nodded in agreement. Shukshin admired America for its sacred love of her freedom, but he never expected their tenacity to exercise it. He looked at the busy streets of Washington, lined with commerce, culture, and liveliness, and was reminded of home. Shukshin could only think about the hard rookie poured into reviving Novosibirsk beauty, prosperity, and progress, and how the Ob River finally got to shine vibrantly once more. The Federation may have won against its enemies, but it needs to to think forwards. Forwards to peace, prosperity, and a brighter future. A meet with Americans. Although we have worked with the U.S. several times in recent history, it's always been in the midst of a political crisis such as the Far East and the Second West Russian War. Now that we're in peacetime, we should arrange for President Shukshin to meet with the current pr American president, Gene Kirkpatrick, and discuss the future of Eastern Europe and build a positive relationship between our two leaders. Good relations with Gene Kirkpatrick will make our entry into the OFN much smoother and, of course, with less opposition. Uh, but like I did say, we do have some comments to go through, such as, do both trees. Um, actually, why we're losing Duma support is because of this guy right here. Pokushkin's doing some shady stuff behind the scenes, so that's why we're losing support. Which, honestly, really does suck. But... Oh well, it is what it is, I suppose you could say. Uh, someone says, actually, quite a few guys support this uh, comment as well, that it's okay to use com a console command sometimes, just because there's sometimes some really just BS things happening, so I do appreciate your support with that. So, I, I don't know, I, I'm very self-conscious, I guess you could say, whenever I'm using console commands, so... My apologies about that. Apply for membership. Well, the peace is finally in place. It's time to meet with the United States of America and formally begin the process of joining the organization of... Free nations. With the two of the most powerful nations on the planet united together in one alliance to defend the cause of freedom in any place where it's threatened, the forces of tyranny will quake in fear at the mere thought of challenging liberty, knowing that standing there at the gates are the twin titans of liberty, two giants together as Uno. Or one. Cool. Because if we join, actually join the OFN, that'd be incredibly strong with America and basically reunite Russia after we whipped the Germans last time. And we should have Romania with us too, right? Yeah, that we should. They're led by Cornelio Coppolsu. Oh, look at this guy. I know about Chick. I know about Chick. Nice. Very cool. And we're building up some more civvies as well, so we can hopefully cut down some of the debt, but we'll see what happens with that. Am I right? And then we'll talk about a presidential conference. Might as well apply for membership, which we should be able to get in, right? So, presidential conference. So, we're growing up in the rural Siberian village of Skrosky. 
Vasily never thought he would grow up to unite the warlord ridden Russia under the banner of the Federation, becoming the president, leading the war effort against Germany, and securing an alliance between Russia and the U.S., and yet here he was in the White House before a large group of American reporters, with American president to his right. President Shukshin, millions of Americans are curious about what you will do now that Moscow is part of the Russia again. A young reporter asked Shukshin directly. Vasily cleared his voice. He had been preparing for this conference for some time now, trying his best to learn English, although it wasn't the best. The Russian Federation seeks to establish a relationship with other democratic nations such as the USA to ensure Russia's safety while we rebuild, Shukshin answered. The reporter nodded his head, sitting down and jotting down notes. Another reporter stood up and asked Shukshin a question, this time a female reporter. What's the future of Russian and uh, German relations now that they have been pushed out of Europe? Do you believe another war between Russia and Germany may be on the horizon, the lady asked? I well, sincerely hope not. I doubt Russia and Germany will be on. Now you say... Speaking terms for a long time, hopefully in the future, Germany will go of <clears throat> Hitler's vision and pursue good relations with the Federation, the Russian president replied. The young lady nodded, seemingly satisfied with the answer before sitting down. Uh, Vasily nodded and sighed in relief as the questions turned back to their own president, the United States of America. Uh, president, of course, Gene Kirkpatrick. English was certainly not his best language, but if he could secure an alliance with the U.S. and have Russia join the OFN, then learning and speaking was well worth the trouble. On the world stage, Russia makes its bold impression. Oh. And our next challenge. With our place in the world decided, now comes the time for the Russian Federation to step forth once more into the global stage. It's essential that the Federation establishes its own cultural, economic, and military sphere of influence and secure the borders of our motherland. Russia must never again be left vulnerable to invasion by hostile foreign powers who seek to subjugate the Russian people never ever again. A couple comments to include, though. Um, someone says, with the CSTO, don't kick out the Germans. Ooh, we joined the open. Um, yeah, I don't, I, next time we do this, I do not want to do kick out the Germans. Actually, after this episode, the next episode, we'll go back, actually, in time and not annex everybody, actually, and have, like, the Ukraine, the Volga Germans, maybe, and we'll see who, who actually gets around here, just so that we have a big old collection, and then we'll do the CSTO one, so. Someone says we should get superpowers to destroy Japan. Or even Germany as well. How does and also someone says or asks, how does someone get unbanned from Paradox Forums? Well, first step is to not get banned. And I honest, honestly have no idea because I'm never on my account. But if you guys know, please look, let me know in the comments below. But the Russian Federation joins the OFM in a press conference in Moscow. Russian President Vasily Shukshin has declared that after some negotiations, the Russian Federation can finally begin the process of formally joining the Organization of Free Nations with Romania. Look at that. The American government has responded to this development with great enthusiasm. Happy to have touted fourth power join the ranks of the UFM. The Russian president and I have become great friends recently. His eagerness to ensure the freedom and safety of his people is admirable, and I look forward to working with him going forward, President Jean uh, Kirkpatrick of the United States of America commented in response to this new development. As American and Russian flags wave in Moscow and Washington, some are worried about the increased tensions this will cause, and without have, with having a powerful American ally now on the doorstep of both the Einheit's Pact and the Cold Prosperity Sphere. The free roll just got a little bigger. Oh, that's so nice. Do we get any benefits of that? Actually, do we get voting rights or anything? Look at that central design bureau. That looks pretty darn good to me. Not gonna lie, I like that a lot. Strengthened Sluzba Bezo Nasposti, which I... Huh. The All Russian Army, which is not bad. Our next challenge, my friends, our eyes on the world. Oh, wow, there's a whole lot more here than I thought there was. Here he goes, Stepan, and make sure to get this done by tomorrow. Stepan looked up from his desk. The smell of coffee was still fresh in his mind. One of his colleagues placed a stack of files behind his computer as he gave a polite nod to Stepan. Don't worry, you're gonna like this one. Stepan smiled as he reached for his coffee mug and grabbed the first file. He almost dropped his mug in surprise. Polish home army? Resistance contacts? Weapon shipments? Stepan couldn't believe what he read. It seemed like Russia had bigger plans. Freeing Poland seemed like an impossible endeavor, but anything that drives Germany more up against the wall would ultimately be a victory for the free world. He grabbed another file from the stack and opened it. The McLeek? He thought they were under Japanese control but it appears that's not the case. Another Chinese Republic? That's bound for trouble, but both China and Russia could get far together with the right people like Stepan. He kept reading more files, Mongolian uprisings, and nomad cooperation in Ulaanbaatar. They gladly accept Russian help. Stepan did wonder how the Copra Spirit Sphere would react to this, but considering that the Federation showed his might against Germany, they'd probably back down. Armenia, that's a name he hadn't heard for a while, a nation that might have suffered even more than Russia did. There's still some rebel groups whose fires are still burning, and Russia would provide the wood they needed. Surely Turkey wouldn't mind. Stepan looked at the stack and smiled. He remembers that when one man repaired the Russian nation, and once again, Vasily Shukshin will repair other countries. He grabbed another one and looked down into his mug empty. He needed more coffee, for this is going to be a long, long day. But a rise of the West. Although beaten, the Knights Pack still maintains a tight grip over the many peoples of Europe. With the rack and chaos as a result of their defeat in the Second West Russian War, there exist opportunities for the Federation to expand its influence to the West and bring liberty to the oppressed of Europe. We shall free the people of German rule one nation at a time. 
remnants of... Oh. Let's do Eyes of the East next. Towards the east, the Japanese Empire rules over the lands of China with an iron grip, but lately its grip is slipping as murmurs of a great Chinese rebellion is in the, in the name of the freedom of Japanese oppression can be heard throughout occupied China. Whether these rumors are true or not, it's undeniable that the Japanese Empire has fallen from grace in recent years. With this in mind, the Federation should move to exploit Japan's weakness and establish a photo in East Asia in preparation for the Great War to come. Members of Poland. Despite a long history of rivalry, the Polish government has always been, or people, have always been seen as brothers of the Russian people. Especially in recent years, much like us, Poland has been betrayed by the Germans. They were stabbed in the back. There were people murdered, then thousands, and the lands colonized like us. The Polish nation resisted the Germans, but unlike Russia, Poland were swiftly, the Poles were sw swiftly beat by the Reich once more. Every day, the memory of Poland fades away into obscurity. The strength of the Poles waning as the Germans continue to colonize what remains of the Polish homeland, however. With the defeat of the Reich, a new opportunity has presented itself. With proper Russian assistance, we can help rebuild the home army of Poland and help the nation break free of the rule of the German while the master of Europe continues to be plagued with domestic issues. Soon, our Slavic brother will be with Russia once more and finally free the Nazi menace that has ruled his lungs for far too long and rebuild the home army. Although disunited and broken after the nation fell once more to the Nazi armies, uh, the Polish home army is the only hope we have of being able to free Poland once more. They may not have enough strength to free their homeland, though Russian material support and military advisors assisting them with every step of the way. The home army will rise once more and finally be able to stave off the Nazi Hydra. Oh. This one, oh, if you want to read this one, please go ahead. It ought to complete it, but where it all began. Look at this. When the Federation came to Nova Polska, the Poles readily accepted the offer of ascension to become an autonomous republic. For the Poles of the Republic, many felt that so long as long as their cultural autonomy was guaranteed, there wasn't much to complain about, especially after the years of anarchy. The Shukshin, uh, then Shukshin, started dropping massive amounts of development into the Nova Polish Repo Republic, and so by the time the Second West Russian War started, the Republic served as a model autonomous republic. When the Federation went west, Nova Polska served as a model and dreamed to convince the various ethnic groups of Eastern Europe to assist in the war against German oppression. As the war traveled west, the Polish within the Federation gave everything they could, serving with distinction after all. Who knew the cost of defeat by the Germans and the Polish people? When the news reports show the front lines getting ever closer to the homeland, the Polish people thought many be the nightmare would finally end. Finally, when the Federation's army was shown to be right at their ancient homeland gates. The streets were filled with anticipation and pride. Maybe, they thought, many, many hoped to visit their relatives or to travel to their old homes and the people of Poland could be rejoined and maybe another miracle of the Vistula would come. Then the ceasefire was declared. Unlike the rest of the Federation, the liberated territories, Nova Polska and the Poles of the Federation had relatively quiet celebrations. They understood why it had to be done, but it didn't make the pain of the loss any more easier. Now, nonetheless... The Federation President and Autonomous Republic's President Stanislaw Skalowski, or Skalski, being adamant about eventually freeing Poland from German oppression, so the Poles of the Federation went back to their daily lives, keeping the story of Poland alive within the Federation, knowing that someday an opportunity to free their homeland would arise. Little did they know it would start with the redeployment of the Nova Polska regiments of Western Russia or Western Ukraine. So long as it is remembered, it cannot be truly lost. The Krakow uprising. I'll get to there in a little bit. Oh, oh, this is a major operation. Okay. So, people of the city of Krakow, people of Poland, the home army still stands strong, the Wehrmacht is distracted, the Germans are weak, your chance for liberation from Nazi tyranny has at least at last arrived. Pick up your arms, rally your fellow brothers in arms, and prepare your fight for your lives. Krakow, rise! Poland's little green men. Kowalski served proudly in one of the Polish regiments during the Second West Russian War. He didn't care about the values of the Federation brought to his town in Nova Polska. Just that they, they would fight against the Germans, Kowalski remembered being in cities like Volgograd, Rostov, Kharkiv, Kiev. And ending the war near Brest, despite the many victories, Poland sitting right across the new border would never sit straight with him. He remained within the Polish units after the war, but his spirit had left, and his passion during the war and the prior disappeared. When a batch of orders required his unit to move to western Ukraine, he didn't think much of it. Only when his superior decreed that they could no longer write letters or make calls about the current location did Kowalski start to question what was going on. When they arrived at the military installation near the Polish border, he was surprised by the raw number of people in rather plain clothing. Officially, they were Polish refugees attempting to flee the violence in the war, and they were now stuck within the Federation. Unofficially, they were the first batch of proud Poles who were to be trained and equipped to jumpstart the second Polish uprising. They were to be equipped and trained, and when the time was right, they would sneak across the border and cause the chaos necessary for the noble Polska units to cross the border and volunteer against the German threat. Kowalski couldn't believe it. Before, it seemed like Russians only kept the Poles around because they needed everyone else against the German threat, but this was different. Poland was to be liberated. Once more to the breach, and the Krakow uprising, the idea of a free Poland was was thought to have been completely destroyed following the conclusion of the German Civil War, a nation annihilated beneath the crushing boot of uh, Nazi Germany once again.
In recent weeks, however, the once lost Polish nation has been slowly been waking up following Russia's victory in the Second, Ru Second West Russian War and the ensuing chaos consuming Germany. In the city of Krakow, pro independence protests became a mass uprising that went on to spread across southern Poland led by Karol Bolzhilia and rebelled Polish Home Army. The German government was swift in accusing the Russian government of orchestrating the recent Polish uprising, claiming that the Russian Federation was taking advantage of the Reich's weakened state. But regardless of whether these claims are true or not, the Poles are fighting once more and their eyes focus on the city of Warsaw. The Reich continues to crumble with the remnants on Armenia. Once part of the Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union, Armenia has endured the reign of terror spearheaded by the Great Wolves of Turkey. Massacres have become commonplace in Armenia as the so National Socialists of Turkey have consistently tried and failed to exterminate the resilient peoples of Armenia. Although the Turks have failed in the past, if nothing is done to save the Armenian people from Turkish oppression, the Great Wolves may one day successfully exterminate the peoples of Armenia, and with it, the idea of the Armenian state will exist only in the pages of history. This is unacceptable. The Federation cannot stand by and watch as what was done to our people is done to Armenia. We must do what we can to liberate the Armenians from the Turkish oppression, and ensure that the ancient identity and culture of Armenia survives, and send in the mo Russia's monster. Dmitry Ivanov is a man who is willing to do whatever needs to be done in order to achieve victory in the name of Russia. With assistance from the off-the-book team created by President Shukshin to combat foreign threats and to fight for the Russian interests, we can cause havoc to the Turkish army, gain insight on their every move, and break them from within. Send in the monster. Oh, we got some of the uh, stuff done too. Very nice. But, oh, Slovakia done, and some advanced oil processing, very good, and encryption. Fear get me no longer. The Mauser rusted softly in the crook of David's shoulder. With a stock nestled under the dark debt of Dilijan, the night sky above cloaked the landscape in darkness, and the fire cracked softly, its tempo erratic in his hands. A relic of the past, it was another night for David. That if that was something to be fine, Pride and now his hands callous and scarred, gripping firmly along the edge of the photo. His dusty black and white coloration was illuminated by the flickering flame in front of him, with the smidged little figures only slightly visible. His eyes drifted quietly or quietly along the front, eyes looking upon these grainy little figures. He'd seen the sight perhaps a thousand times over. Now had sat aside this campfire over and over again after days worth of fighting, his thumb. Running softly against the side of the photo, ever slightly ruffled its dirty white edges, he could still remember their voices, occasionally. Could remember their smiles, their laughter, even in the face of their circumstances before. Their youth, that which was stolen from them, perhaps back then they'd been here. Sitting by his side, perhaps he wouldn't have had to be the only one left. Perhaps there could have been some hope for the future of their people. They call themselves Svedeye for a reason, those who sacrificed, and that was not the case for him. Anush, Tigran, Arax, all gone now. He fought so long now, since he was a young boy, he'd fought for Armenia, yet he had to die for Armenia. He'd lost his friends, family, he'd lost what made it anything to him. His teeth under the scraggly beard that adorned his face was t were tightly grit. The feelings within him he could not describe, a concoction of rage and hurt. Was this his fate, to fight forever for the sake of a people that he could never feel the joys of? He would either die or be alone, either meet his end, or by some means kill, 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 until he finally stood alone atop a mountain of corpses, with which nobody else would finally appreciate the view. What could be one here? Would it ever be worth it? David's face, pampered with dust and suit, had been disturbed by the solemn flow of red-hot tears. There was no means of controlling it anymore, nothing to hold him back. He missed them, he missed his family, he darned every god possible and demanded, and uh, darned the Turk. None of it would be so soothing his pain, and none of it would end the cycle. Until that night sky, the son of Armenia sobbed, knowing that he could not appreciate the fruits of his own struggle, but fun the rebels. Much like the partisans of Croatia, the Armenian rebels have survived in the mountains, but their strength and numbers are faltering as the Armenian people begin to lose faith in resistance. Luckily for the rebels, they have the vast resources of the Russian Federation now available to them. With the Armenians fully equipped with the best equipment we can offer, they can turn the tide and big bat the Turkish forces, bringing new hope for the noble cause of Armenian liberation from the Turkic tyranny. Oh, this is not looking good. Now is it? Oh, Edward Wagner. He's doing very well against these guys. That is absolutely unacceptable. Well, yeah, they have no divisions. Uh... Hmm... What if I were to do some funky stuff off-screen? Actually, are we supposed to send volunteers? No, we can't send volunteers. Um... Hmm... Because they got some Russian military advisors. And home defenses, but another one spawned... Uh... Grosseram Continent Europa. Severe. Oil crisis. Let me see if I can do some funky stuff off screen and see if we can help these guys out just a wee a bit. Polish declaration. President Karol, you're one on in a few. 
Carol checked his clothing one more time, examined the room. Behind him sat the white and red flag of Poland with a coat of arms proudly presented. In front of him sat an ornate table that was finished mere hours ago. The legs adjourned with eagles. He had, had he been only asked months ago if this would be where he was to be seated, he would have laughed. But now he sat ready to speak not only for his group of his self-resistance fighters, but for the entirety of Poland. He cleared his voice once more, prepared to speak into two microphones that sat in front of him. One for radio and one for the viewers on TV that could hear the first new president of Poland in 30 years. The cameras are set, Mr. President. We can start as soon as you're ready. Carol did the first the sign of the cross and then signaled that he was ready to speak to the free world. The lights flickered green and a great big recording logo appeared in bright red Russian text. A broadcast from Poland? Totally didn't cheat for this one. Just to see what... Oh, actually, no event. Look at that. A common idea. Hello, people of the world. My name is Karol Voltyzia. Voltyzia. Acting President of the Third Polish Republic, I've been hoisted on his position by the courageous actions of the Home Army. As of this morning, the fighting ceased between the Home Army and the German Reich. There will be no negotiations about reintegration or subjugation or subjection. The nation of Poland is, as of today, without any shred of doubt, a proud and free nation. I've already reached out to the President of the Russian Federation, Shukshin, and the President of the Autonomous Republic of the Novopolska, Skalski, who I will be meeting in person very soon. With these steps, Poland's freedom will be sealed, and no longer will the people of Poland live divided with fear. To the people of Poland, I say rejoice. We face the very worst of horrors and survived. The road to rebuilding our homeland will be a long and arduous one, but with assistance from our Russian allies to the east, we will lift ourselves out of the darkness and back into the holy light. Furthermore, elections will be held by year's end to usher forward a new democratic and free era. To the German Reich, I have nothing but disdain, and I hope that the people of Germany learn to reject the so-called national socialist rule. As may neither the people of Poland nor Germania free, more prosperous or morally well. To the nations of the royal, I simply say this. Too quickly have the many peoples of this world turned from one another and abandoned each other to establish purity or simple self-interest. From Englishmen to the Japanese, I ask you all, has this madness from nearly 40 years ago made the world a better place? Have your people been made richer, both in soul and materially? Do you feel that you and your ancestors will live in peace? Anyone with a scrap of common sense will know the truth, but there is one thing that saves us all from common darnation. It is the ability for us to overcome and recover from the horrors of the past. Scars will heal. For better or for worse, history marches on. And the past reeks of filth and disgust, but that doesn't have to be the future. The eagles of freedom spread their wings. Totally did not have to cheat, but hey, welcome, Poland. They don't have any focus but hey, that's alright. Let's see what, I'm, what we can do with Armenia, though. Any training needed? Any training? Nope, border all trained up. Send in Russia's monster. As we're trying to cut down a little more on the debt. Uh, if you want to about better industrial expertise, please go right ahead. The vultures of the mountains. Uh, two guards posted at the both entry points, all carrying fully automatic rifles. The central command center is located near the main road, judging from the high security and officers present inside. Two APCs in the parking bay. Be mindful of when those are entering. Uh, there is a bunker door heavily guarded. That has to be where the rebels are being held. Dimitri lowered his binoculars, jotting down the observable details on his notepad before rubbing his eyes and wiping the sweat from his brow. He wasn't used to the heat like here, but he'll manage. The agent sat back against the rocks that just lie beneath his perch, settling himself in for the long wait. The Great Wolves had taken some Armenian rebels prisoner after ambushing their base of operations. The target of interest was Gorgon Dalabaltajan. Yet to sneak into the compound and get the rebels, Gorgon especially yelled out being seen by the Turkish troops. Seemed simple enough, but unlike the werewolves, the Grey Wolves were well armed and well coordinated, unlike at home. Russia's monster didn't have the resources of Russia at his disposal. He will have to be careful if he was to succeed in rebuilding the leadership of the Armenian resistance. Dimitri sighed. At least he wouldn't be alone in this mission. The rebels had given him a guide to copy him on the mission, out of men. He was enthusiastic to leave the bases. He was this type who liked to explore, according to the other rebels. Staying put didn't do him well. He would double as a translator since Dimitri didn't know a lick of Armenian, and he is the one expected to free uh, one of Armenia's best generals. Having a translator make it work here in Armenia just smoother, much smoother. Speaking of Ottoman, Dimitri began to wonder where just his guide had run off to. Just another day at work. The rebels had gained in strength in recent weeks as the Grey Wolves continued to weaken as a result of Dimitri Ivanov's efforts behind the front lines. With Turkey more isolated uh, than ever before, the Armenian leadership has approached their government, requesting the Federation support them in a full-scale democratic revolution against the Turkish government and help them achieve independence from their oppressors. With the Reich still in shambles, now would be the best time to strike what remains of the Turkish Empire. Let the revolution begin. Cool. And, well, of course, we'll see what happens. And I grab one of that because it you can as well. I'd love to cut down more debt, but we can't do that currently. But that's okay. Yeah, a lot of Shukshin, a lot of Pokrishkin here. Uh, where are we at? 54 is still not bueno, man. There you go. 58 is right where it needs to be at. And we get 1.31 every day, which is pretty darn nice, actually. So, yeah. Not bad, overall. Actually. That's a little better. I like this one more. And close and closer to Germania. Which I'm sure they're not doing a focus anymore, because it's 79. It's nearly 1980. Which is insane to think about that we're playing this mod all the way until 1980, but... Oh well. Oh, 
do that one too because we can. Nice. Fun the rebels. All right, in the hall of the mountain king. Oh, Ali was escorting to the rebel HQ, located deep within the Armenian mountains. Beyond the reach of the Turks, he was flanked by two guards, each armed with AKMs, courtesy of the Federation. At the center of the room, looking down at a large map of Armenia marked with various crosses and circles, was the head of the Armenian resistance, Gurgan Zanikjan. Ali uh, cleared his throat, getting the Armenians' attention. Gurgan looked away from the map, staring at the man in the eye for the moment. Hello, I'm Gurgen Zanikjan. I'm the de facto head of the resistance. I presume you're with the Russian intelligence? The Armenian asked as he shook Ali's hand. Ali Gazimov, I'm with the Suzba Bezopasnosti. Ali replied, looking him in the eye. An Azerbaijani, I must confess, I didn't expect the Russians to send, uh, well, your people to deal with us. Gargan stayed as he took a seat and sat down at the table. The tension in the room was palpable during their isolation, despite their isolation. The storm of rivalry that has endured for centuries was seemingly ready to roar at any second. Ali sighed, looking over to the flag of Armenia that hung proudly on the wall. Truthfully, Gurgan, I did not come here. I did not want to be here, Ali began. When they asked me to come here and negotiate the alliance between Armenia and the Federation, I want to say no, but Ali paused for a moment. He wondered what his ancestors would think of him. None of that matter right now, though. There are bigger things than that. Regardless of what he thought about Armenia, one thing was certain. It did not deserve to be massacred and burned to ash by the Turkish insanity that is the Great Wolves. He may be a son of an Azerbaijan, but he refused to stand by and allow this injustice against the Armenians to continue any longer. There are bigger things than the rivalry between our two peoples. We both have endured the evils of imperialism. Azerbaijan, thankfully, has been liberated from those who would have sought to annihilate our nation, just as the Turkish wish to do to you. If you want your people to survive these difficult times, we have to put aside our differences and work together. Ali exclaimed, or explained, turning away from the flag and looking back at the man in the chair. The room was quiet for a moment before Gurgen slowly began to nod. You're right, there are bigger matters than the rival between our peoples. I'm willing to set it aside for the sake of freedom. I believe we have business to discuss. Please take a seat. Gurgen said with a smile, gesturing to the available chair. Ali smiled in return as he took the seat, prepared to go to get to business, setting aside the past for a brighter future. In alliance with the clique. For decades, the lands of China have remained broken with much of eastern China under the subjugation of Japan. The situation in western China is much better, although it's mostly free from the influence of Japan. The governments of the regions are largely, largely made up of despotic warlords, with a notable exception of Mont Clique. Mont Clique. It's home to the remnants of the Kuomintang, the party that once ruled the Republic of China prior to the Japanese invasion. Although they have continued to persist in China over the many years since their downfall, the powers greatly diminished and in the current state seem doomed to remain a warlord state struggling to survive. The camp team may not be able to retake all of China in the near future, but with the help of the Russian Federation, we can help them invade their despotic neighbors, consolidate the control over Western China, and stand as a beacon of hope and liberty in the remnants of the subjugated China, the Mountain War. After a long war, another war long in the making has broken out in the mountains of the Caucasus. The centuries-long conflict between the Turkish and Armenian peoples burns bright once more, and the, the war comes after the recent seizure of Rakhine Commissar Kalkasin by the Russian Federation following his victory in the Second West Russian War. Many international observers have accused of reintegrating or reigniting the conflict through openly supporting the Armenian rebels. As soldiers, and partisans clash in the hills and mountains of Armenia, this conflict may very well determine the world will witness the rebirth of a free Armenian democracy or the eradication of Armenia as a people and concept. Gargan. I love Gargan. Can you actually win here? Please tell me you can win here. Please tell me you can win here. You should be able to win. I don't want to, have to go off screen to do that. But West Chinese industrial investment. Western China may not hold as much industrial potential as the East, but building new industrial facilities in major settlements such as Xingning and Yuquan will strengthen their economy. Left them from the economic rot that has plagued the region since the sign of Japanese war and gave them a decisive edge over their warlord neighbors when the time comes for their armies to step forth and at last reunify the ro broken lands of China. Meeting the Moths. Several men stood around the refurbished presidential desk that sat in the renovated Kremlin. The table was fairly eccentric, far from the one that Shukshin had used in Novosibirsk. But its advisors swore for days that the table needed to match the new prestige that the president of the Russian Federation held. It didn't need to be this way, but sta statements backed by action were the quickest way to restore the Russian spirit and power globally. Russia was back on the world stage, and it wasn't going to waste any time proving it. As such, it was only natural that one of the first conversations over that desk was what to do with China. The Maoists are, as you know, a political faction within northwestern China. They've held out for decades against Japanese pressure and harbor interests to overthrow the Japanese. Furthermore, they're ideologically varied, but not stringent on any particular beliefs. The Maoists are classical KMT believers, especially the current leader, Ma Zhuyan. Ideally, they want democracy and develop China, meaning nothing we would want or suggest to them would be outside their wheelhouse. In short, they're malleable to our interests and needs, and we can trust they'll be willing to cooperate with us, especially if we give them enough support that western China will fall under their rule. When the Chinese Intelligence Division Department was, had finished, it looked to the others before finally stopping on Shukshin, waiting to see if the president had any questions to ask. 
The president slouched in his chair, uttered in an exhausted tone. Well, obviously, we're going to meet with them, but beyond that, what can we expect? Western China is far from a kind place, and it's unlikely that even United could overthrow the sphere. Nonetheless, it could serve as a thorn if given the right resources and the right crisis. They could swing eastwards and establish a regime, even if they don't liberate the rest of China anytime soon. Having a state between us and the heart of the spheres that is aligned with us would help us wonderfully. We can build up another market that our businesses can work in, strengthen our image globally, bolster our security, and hopefully make a strong term ally. In short, it's an all around beneficial idea to help them develop and take over the region, especially if we're planning on a longer term confrontation with the sphere. Shukshin started to fix his sitting position only to utter the, all the words he needed to. In that case, you can get to work with the KMT, send an envoy, and start sending supplies along with advisors and support. How long will it take for the Maas to take all of Western China outside of the Japanese rule? Only a few weeks. Send military equipment. To put it simply, the military equipment the clique has is rather quite outdated. Much of not much of it not suitable for the field. The clique is to have any chance in consolidating control over Western China. It'll need the best equipment possible. The Russian Federation has no shortage of weaponry, especially after the war with the Reich, and we are more than capable of supplying their armies with the best military equipment we can offer. Journey to the East. The Rostam had been traveling for quite a while, but really, over a week with a contingent of guards and support diplomats when he finally saw the old and faded KMT in the distance. Beneath the flag, several men with a fair bit of dusty but relatively new uniforms stood initially. The Chinese soldiers prepared for the worst. Uh, aiming their old rifles at the convoy of armored cars, the Chinese lowered their weapons only when Rostam had ordered the soldiers to pull out the Russian flags. When the Russians finally got to crossing the uh, crossing of Chinese soldiers, a terse set of glances were exchanged, only to be broken up by Rostam's Mandarin. Supposedly the best the Federation had to offer, the Chinese soldiers struggled to follow, but understood what the Tartar and the rest of the Russian detail were here for. They were to meet Ma Jian. The local Chinese officers stood or offered to take them to Jian personally and join the Russians on the trip. Rostam used the officer to brush up on the local Verlin Mandarin, and I was taken aback by how nasal the pronunciation of Chinese words were. The two became fast friends, much to the detriment of the driver, who would spend the rest of the trip listening to the two sharing details and information about the Chinese language. The two didn't even notice when they finally arrived at the center of the Maklik. The beauty of language knows no bounds. Nice. China's best help. But Rostam tried rubbing off as much dirt and wrinkles that he had developed over this trip. The second... <clears throat> He had arrived, he was separated from the new Chinese friend, and was taken to what he understood to be a government building. One of the local men asked Rustam to wait a moment in one of the rooms, of which he was happy to oblige. He was beyond tired and the long trip and needed a movement to refocus his mind. The room itself was a fair bit bland. It had a window, bed, table, chairs, and a classical Chinese painting on the wall depicting a mountainside. For a moment, Rustam was disappointed, but the Rustam was quick to reprimand himself. Only a few years ago did Russia look like this, but despite it, not only did the Federation pull itself up, it stood up to the Germans and came out victorious. victorious. The Chinese can do the same, especially given the right push. A few minutes passed, and finally the fresh, freshly dressed officer appeared outside his doorway and announced that Ma Zhuan, Zhiyan, was finally able to meet with the Russian envoy. So Rostam was surprised Ma Zhiyan, or I keep saying his name wrong, my apologies, Ma Zhiyuan, was far more plain looking than he expected. He proudly wore his military uniform with bright and clean KMT symbols, but the eyes had betrayed both his sadness and strength. Ji Yuan had been fighting longer than most Russians had. It was clear that for him, the war never ended. The first words he heard uttered were not bold promises, but an apology. I'm sorry for not preparing adequately for your arrival. But we didn't have much clue of when you would be arriving or from what direction. Therefore, we haven't been prepared food, or preparing any food, or any of the etiquette fit for a representative of your nation. Rostam was quick to affirm the general, please, you need to worry. I grew up in a Russia that was being bombed regularly. I understand your position and difficulty perfectly, so you don't need to apologize. The one thing I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt is that we understand your struggle, and that's why we're here to help. I am to become the permanent representative of the Russian Federation to your government. Furthermore, I am here to inform you numerous supplies and support are to come to assist you and your government in the reclamation of China, starting with the West. Ma Ji Yuan seemingly had taken, his weights taken off his shoulders when the admis admission of aid was uttered. It might have been cold calculus in Moscow or genuine interest in rebuilding China, but for once in his life he felt maybe China had a true friend. A bond forged against oppression. Leaving a mark. Where's Baba? Li Jing asked her mother. He left for the factory early this morning, my love, Mama said. What would you like for breakfast? They ate porridge and went outside to play. Where's Baba? Li Jing asked. He can't come home for lunch, my dear, Mama said, so they ate noodles and talked about the white and black striped butterflies they saw outside. Where's Baba? The girl asked, or the kid asked. You won't be home for a few more hours, my pet, or are you ready for your bath, Mama said. She can let Mama wash and braid her hair, but it was no fun without Baba. And, of course, where's Baba? He hasn't finished his shift, little one. Come read with me, Mama said. Of course, Jing knew all the stories by heart, but it wasn't the same without Baba's silly voices. He can't tuck you in tonight, my heart, but he left me a kiss to lay on your forehead, Mama said. Jing smiled sadly and lay down to sleep. At midnight, Ji, uh, Li Jing heard the front door close. Baba, is that you, she said? Baba laughed. Yes, it is, he said. I missed you, beloved. I missed you. Why were you gone so long, she asked. Baba asked to work, little one, he said. We need money for rent, but never mind that. Look what I got for you. 
He pulled a cloth doll from his pocket. It was the size of a child's hand, made of soft fabric, with buttons for eyes and a tiny scrap of silk, red silk for a heart. Ji, uh, Li Jing took the doll and smiled. I love it, Baba. Thank you. Her father knelt and kissed her on the cheek. I love you, my daughter. To understand your parents' love, you must give it to others. And also, I guess Armenia just won, so... Thanks, Armenia. We appreciate your contributions to the Russian Federation. Huh. Yeah, seriously, I just made sure that these guys could win, and we just annex them. Which is great. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love it, but... Established the West Chinese Republic. The Camptees endured decades of humiliation. First at the hands of the Chinese warlord states, then the Japanese Empire. They have been exiled from Nanjing and forced to struggle in the Qinghai province, and it's time for the years of humiliation to finally, of course, end. Whoa, they go straight to war with a lot of people. Free Western... Uh, Free Republic of Western China. Uh, the KMT is now fully armed and ready to step forth and reunite the lands of Western China. No more shall the KMT endure failure in battle. With the backing of the Russian Federation, they will achieve victory over their warlord enemies and take the first important steps in the long journey to reunite China under the vision of the late Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Yeah, we can see what happens. Interesting to see what happens. Send them nothing but guns. More guns, guns, guns. As an American, we gotta send them lots of guns. Make sure the guns don't end up in the wrong hands, but there's no guarantee. Because guns, 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 come aplenty. And then our brothers in Mongolia. The people of Mongolia have become reliable allies of the Russian Federation. But they have become a people without a homeland. Divided between the Russia and the West and Japan to the East, the majority of the Mongolian homeland remains dominated by an empire from across the sea. The Mongolians in the Federation have called for the West to become an independent state, wishing to rule themselves as the Russian people now do. President Shukshin sympathizes with their wishes, but with, the, with so much of the land occupied, the Mongolians take cannot function long. The Mongolians will have, to, will have their state. Once Ulan Batar has been restored to its, its rightful owners. Wow, I've never been in a campaign where we get a 5 to 10% poverty rate. It doesn't help us that much, but, like, also gladly take it. Is that a little bit of time? I don't really give a crap. I didn't help out that much, but, hey, I'll take whatever we can get, you know. Oh, the Democratic Republic of Iran, and there's those guys over there, too. All right, Ma Clique, hopefully you do okay. I don't want you to die. I don't want to go off screen again, which you probably will have to. Make sure you do real bueno. Ah, there we go. The West China War. Since the late forties, Japan has held a stranglehold over the Chinese government. Well, uh, while the mainland is under the jure control of the Republic of China, Western China has been told to maintain de facto independence as a series of unrecognized warlord states. The Russian Federation has recognized Ma Clique, a KMT remnant held by the Ma Clan as a legitimate government. The clique has taken many since then military action against several notable warlords in the Tibetan government. Military shipments from Japan to Tibet are sent through airlifts. Other warlord factions have refused Japanese support. The response from the INS pact is entirely neutral. The OFN, however, has shown some interest in the development of a rival government to Japan. Will a beacon of hope rise in China? The West awakens. Oh, so we can actually send volunteers. You can only send one division. And mountains? Oh, I'm not sending tanks, bro. Or APCs. Okay, it looks like we're going to have to. Okay, that sucks. Um, hopefully we can just do well here. I think earlier we could have sent stuff, but whatever. Please don't die here fast. Please, please, please. Rally the nomads. There are many things throughout Mongolia that Japan maintains total control over. The nomads are not one of them. This hasn't meant the Japanese have tried through the occupation of Mongolia. The Japanese have massacred the riders of the steppes, battling them on the open plains, vying for control over the vast territories. The nomads seek to only rule themselves, but perhaps we could reach out to the nomads of Mongolia and rally them against the Japanese in the name of a truly free Mongolia. Cool. Hmm. Interesting. Altan Tob Tobchi. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Please find your briefing packets in the blue folders to your right, said General Gregory Langemach. Uh, the um, almond-scented boardroom of Phoenix Holding Company was filled with the busy men of every kind, entrepreneurs, managers, Slilovex. Uh, side elbow to elbow, the mahogany conference table, and not all were part of the Phoenix team. Yes, there were Alexander Belov, CEO of Phoenix Infantry Solutions. And yes, there's that Deniska, balladed in a Phoenix tractor and machinery supplied with that stupid smile on his face. But across the table sat Roman Levitsky, C COO of Titan Research and Development, and Sergei Pavelich, Pavelchev. CGO of Sibir Community Lending. Each of them was just a cog in the machine, but their presence represented something more in alignment of the mega corporations on the crucial issue of profit. If we will turn to page three, we can begin the executive summary of Fennec's extraction or extractive f findings. 
Langemach said. Exact Extractive prospectors are presented data indicating significant deposits of gold, uranium, oil, and fluoral spar throughout the Mongol countryside due to the incompetence of the Kalgan government and massive resistance from socialist militias and nomad tribesmen. These items are almost universally unexploited. I doubt the Mongols will just let us waltz in and take them, Belov said. Yes, that's correct, Longmok said. On page 8, we've detailed probable long term costs of security operations in the proposed Mongol Republic. Levitsky frowned. Mongol Republic? I haven't heard anything about this, he said. In light of the Federation's orientation away from the co prosperity sphere, Phoenix has devised a strategy to access the Mongol market, and through it a broad East Asian consumer base, Longmok said. We intend to take advantage of this instability in the Mingjiang region to empower rebellious liberal elements as well as restless tribal groups. By arming and supplying the opposition, the Federation will find itself in an optimal negotiating position to obey obtain favorable trade agreements in a newly born state isolated from its neighbors, and how do you intend to convince President Shukshin and his stooges in the Federal Council? Levitsky asked. Longamak simply smiled. Shukshin's a bleeding heart. Have you seen his plans to liberate Armenia, of all places? He hardly needs a push to bring democracy and freedom to an oppressed minority. Now, here are the, here are the proposed extraction sites. Headlines. Walking to the empty store. The young man's gaze was drawn away from the cigarettes he had originally intended to buy instead to the newspaper rack. Where well, the news newspaper had arrived fresh out of the box. Whistling to himself, he shuffled closer to get a better look. Shukshin sends thousands of Russians to die in the Better Mountains. Save our sons, President Shukshin supporting maniacs. The delusions of the president and why you should vote for a Siloviki. The man scoffed, grabbing the paper and scanning the cover page as he paid for his cigarettes. He had, he had known from the very start, Vasily Shukshin. That slimy dude. Ah, uh, was no angel after all. Anything else, sir? The cashier said after the man paid for cigarettes. Ah, uh, yeah, actually, the young man replied. Send the newspaper on the counter. This, please. That'll be 15 rubles. Lowman stated, placing those rubles on the counter, he quickly left and settled down on a bench before taking a cigarette out of his pack he just bought and stuck it in his mouth. The newspaper took the stance of a concerned mother. Deathly afraid that her son would perish in the Tibetan mountains, Russians could not withstand the rough terrain of China. The newspaper wrote, and the lack of consideration for the logistics of an intervention from the Federation would inevitably lead to a catastrophe sooner rather than later. Not to mention the questionable past this so-called Maklik had. His blood boiled as he stumbled to his feet, clamped the papers shut. The president was making a terrible decision. That was when he realized what he had to do. This is a democratic country. He didn't have to just vote to for Shin. And he wouldn't. Next election, he swore he would do everything in his power to oust an incompetent president out of power. He didn't want to be sent to Tibet to die. He got up from his chair, tossed a cigarette into the bin, and went to look for another political party support. Grumbling under his breath, the only ones that he could truly represent the youth of Russia would get his vote. A blow to Shukshin's ever-perfect reputation. So, I want to finish these guys off first. And these guys probably aren't that bad, honestly, but whatever. Or just go to Lhasa. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but Lhasa. Yeah, cool. Rally nomads and friends in Ulaanbaatar. Although Ulaanbaatar is firmly in the, under the rule of Japan, President Shukshin and his friends in the city, powerful and influential friends who can rally the oppressed people of Mongolia and lead them forward to victory. We should reach out to Nan Sagin Bagabandi and inform him of our mission to liberate Mongolia from the imperial rule of Japan via his papa states of Mingjiang and establish a free Mongolian republic in its place. Oh, do we get it? Oh, I guess we did. You guys are fast. You're taking, honestly, not a bad amount of attrition, especially because of the all-Russian army and it's only desert here. Like, that's actually really good. Actually, that's okay. That's a bit too extreme for me. Kurul Tai, on the banks of the river Tul, far from cities wreathed in smoke and ash, a blue girl welcomed many, many visitors. Hail, brother of the Torgut, uh, said Gal Batar Batuhan. Oh, what kind of greeting is that for your old uncle Batsai Khan? Ganbat Batsai Khan said. Why, I remember when you were still a little Bahutan, always up to mischief. Come give me a hug, the old man clucked his nephew and weathered old brown and with weathered brown arms and a snaggletooth smile on his face. Oh, but not so young anymore, Uncle Batsai Khan exclaimed. With muscles like those, the girls will be crawling all over you. Uncle, not now, Bahutan said with his laugh. We have to focus more important things. Here, come inside. Bahutan and Batsai Khan marched into the gate together. Inside, seven weathered oaken men sat waiting their hosts. Uncle Batsai, uh, Uncle Batsai Khan, these are our family's guests. Selengyoro Ayan of the Dower. Altan Garel, Monk Bat of the Northwest Reaches, Bat Jargal Timison of Kansu, 
Gonzoreg Ulangan, Ulanagan of the southeast, and Ulangan Batar, Chulun, and Essen, the eldest sons, Uncle Baitzal Khan, merely nodded, and with myself and Bahu Khan, we make nine, an auspicious number, nephew. When any luck we can get, Gan Batar, Bahu Tan said, and I've spoken to each of you by letter. We know that de Dem Chong Dong Grub's heir is failing and falling. The question is, what will we do? Some of my family have asked me to support the government, others have asked me to support the communists, but as the head of my father's house, the choice falls to me. The old man nods one. We would like to hear your decision. All together, or not at all? I've been contacted by the Russian president. They want to form a new Mongol republic, free of communist dictators alike, Bahutan said, and murmured to send bound from one wall of the gear to another. Foreigners always seek to exploit us, whether they come from the middle of the kingdom or the north, Ayan said. I agree, said Timonson, and they will favor the city dwellers. I am with both of you, Bahutan said, but there are only two sides today, for those for the Japanese and those against. We are against the Japanese, no? We would not have come to this if it meant to fighting for the Chrysanthemum throne, Monk Bot said. I have dealt with the Russians before, and if you have a sense of respect. I propose this plan. We work together with the city dwellers to force out Japan's dogs. When the Russians move to establish puppets, we use our control of the countryside to demand protections for our people, Bahutan said. An end to forced relocation, Ayan, Man, Ayan said. At minimum, Bahutan said. If we fight as the sons of the oceanic master, as we all are, then we can demand even more than that. And suppose they deny us. Are we going to fight our countrymen? Even if they are city dwellers, I have no desire to shed Mongol blood, Timonson said. Neither does my nephew, Uncle ba Bai Sai Khan said. But when Chinggis Khan united her tribes into the First Great Empire, did not slay Wang Khan and his servants? Sure, the servants of Demchong Gong Grob have murdered more Mongolians than the Russians or the Japanese dreamed of. Our responsibility is to our families and our kin, and if that means we must wield the sword, then so be it. Thank you, Uncle Bahutan said. Or Bahuan said. Batuhan. That is my position as well, but I don't believe it will come to that. I believe our strength alone will convince the Russians to accept their demands. They will not want to fight a guerrilla war against a mobile for foe so soon after the war with the Germans. The seven guests hesitated, but one by one they stood and offered their support to the God Gan Batar Bahutan. The black banner unfurls again. I apologize for my mispronunciations. Like, I don't read Mongolian ever, so. Productive deliberations. In the streets of Ulaanbaatar, a car is burning. Dozens of young men, tribesmen, and city dwellers alike beat the iron horse with bats, tire, irons, and garbage, anything they can get their hands on. They have lived their entire lives in terrible poverty. Many of their parents were killed in the rebellion. Many more have watched the Japanese and Chinese grow fat on the spoils of the Pan-Asian dream, while their nation, like homes, have grown only follow. Their rage is spilling over like a tsunami pouring into a teacup. From a window in a nearby office building... Uh, not Saglin Bagabandi watches his peers unleash her anger. He too was only a child during the rebellion. His home province of Zav Khan was burnt to cinders in the endless battles between the People's Revolutionary Council and the Dung and D slugs. But unlike his brothers and sisters in the street, he kept his anger leashed. It waits by his side, obedient, waiting to be set free. The protests are growing. M. E. said, I doubt the government will be able to maintain control of Ulaanbaatar much longer. I agree. The question is, who will control the city when the prince is forced to withdraw? Natsagin said, We all know the Bolsheviks are waiting in the shadows, enticing her people to destruction, but I'll not allow my people to fall prey to demagogues. Natsagin turned from the window to face Mend Saikani, and it is a minor Mongol politicians and entrepreneurs, each waited, watching him intently, sizing him up. Could this young man be the key to their salvation, or was he another useless fl flatterer? Mongolia is in crisis, N said. On one end, despots and cowards that bow to Tokyo, on the other, bloodthirsty revolutionaries would reduce our people to slavery. But we can offer a better future. I believe it is time to embark, er, embark irreversibly on the road to democracy. We must build a government that can satisfy both the needs of business and the needs of our brothers outside. Outside, the furious screams of hopeless men reach their crescendo. I won't promise an easy road, not Sagin said, but for our people's future, does not lie in Tokyo, does not lie in Marxism, and certainly, he said with a practice of grimace, does not lie in the streets. Democracy, good governance, and civil society followed up with the Mongol Rebellion. The Japanese Empire is the press Mongolia for falling enough. No more shell nations has endured such terrible pain that Russia knows all too well. With the Empire of the East distracted with their increasingly rebellious puppet state in China, the time has come to call Natsagan or Sagin to rally the people of central Mongolia behind them and begin their great rebellion against their eastern occupiers. With the nomads working together and the Russian Federation at their side, the possibility of a free Mongolian state is at last within reach. I apologize for mispronunciations again. Holy crap, like this is difficult to read. Can we just capitulate them? Come on. Thank you. That's all I really, literally wanted. So go and relocate. Up here. Move. Oh. And there they go, too. Why can you only see one division, man? Oh. 
Look at this guy. A step of light. On the vast plains of Mongolia, another civil war rages as the Mongolian people, under the leadership of Mongolia Democrat Natsagin Bagabandi, rallying the nomads of the plains and the remnants of the former People's Rope Front under the banner of a free Mongolia. The Japanese Empire has dismissed the rebellion as a minor revolt, seeing that the military forces of Minjiang are more than equipped to handle the deal with the rebels. The international community, however, is far more skeptical of Minjiang's strength, taking note of the unusually modern equipment. Military equipment. The Mongol rebels will on the battlefield. As the step burns once more, of course. Some are left to wonder whether the co-prosperity sphere will continue to dominate East Asia, or will this conflict be the first of many that will lead to the downfall of the Japanese Empire? Freedom or subjugation? Doesn't matter. We're going to get some fighters and get some more casts. Well, if we can. Oh, well, you guys got to deploy first anyway, so. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and boom. Well, should be okay here. This one should be okay. Here, I'd love to send stuff, but move your fat butts up. Seriously. Seriously. Bro. Nice. And then, of course, united and free. After so many years of pain, suffering, and humiliation, the Russian Federation has been fully cleansed of the defeats at the hands of Germany. Russia is once more an influential nation capable of using its cultural, economic, and military map beyond its native borders. No more shall we fear our nation collapsing in anarchy. No more shall we fear the forces of authoritarianism holding taking hold of our motherland. No more shall Eurasia fear subjugation by foreign powers. The Russian Federation stands at the ready, prepared to do whatever it takes to ensure that the Russian, Russia and her allies remain forever united and free. Remember, freedom is not free. Go in, boys. I want to see how much damage we can do. Oh, just let's just go this way then. Yeah, it's not even contest there. Freedom isn't free. It's been a busy day. Alexei juggling, caring for a son that never seemed to stop crying while dumping all the stuff he owned into the boxes to be moved into their new house. As he gazed at his unusually empty room, doing a final check before leaving, he noticed something out of the corner of his eye, a framed photograph. He picked it up gingerly, brushing some suit off the artifact as fuzzy. Memories of his great-grandfather's face suddenly became much clearer. He still remembered the old man's bright smile and cheerful nature that had always been slightly off-put by the eye patch he, used, he had to don in order to hide that nasty scar he had sustained in Barbarossa all those years ago. And next to his granddad, stationed right next to his own father, his arms crossed, and a stern expression on his steely face. He gathered the remains of his family and fled east after the initial collapse of Bukharin's at USSR, etching on a livelihood in the fledgling Central Siberian Republic. When Pokrushin revolted, he was one of the first to flock to the Falcon's banner, awaiting nothing more than the peace and stability for the family. To his left, his dear father, hands on his hips and a smirk on his face, who had fought in the Siberian War in his twenties, braved the hardships of toiling under the corporation's heel, being their family's sole breadwinner, all, all the while supporting the soon-to-be president Shukshin in his bid to lead the Federation, and finally he, a soldier with the first-class honors, serving from the final reunification war to the Second West Russian War itself. They had all played their part in Russia's history, and after so many generations, so much death and so much pain, it was finally all over. As Alexei stared at the sleeping baby lying snugly in his lap, amusedly, he couldn't help but smile. After so much sacrifice, people like Alexei could rest easy. How many? How much more focus is there? Oh my God! Please tell me this is almost over. Like this, I, I like, I love what they've done, but there's just so much that it's almost too much. But Russia has been reclaimed, but there still exists another challenge ahead of us: a vast new stellar frontier of space. It's vast; it's the potential only glimpsed by at, by the Americans and Germans. But unlike the other global superpowers who squabble over the limited lands of Earth, the Federation has looked up towards the skies, seeing the infinite potential of stars that exist beyond the boundaries of our atmosphere. The U.S. and the Reich have broken the atmosphere and left their mark in humanity's newest chapter that will see our species reach the stars. It's time for Russia to also breach the atmosphere, much like the stellar rivals have, and lead humanity into a stellar global era and age. Why the hell did you go down here? Oh my goodness, yeah, the AI has no idea what it's doing right now. Come on. Oh my god. Get your buzz over there. I'll be honest, like, this is a bit too much. I don't like how much extreme reading there is. Like, I'm... Do you know, I know, is like... You know, reading simulator. But, like, this is a bit too much in my opinion. 
that's probably just my opinion, but like, Jesus Christ, construct the Cosmodrome. The Cosmodrome was the name of the rocket launch facility developed by Titan. Zone for the construction in the Ablu Amur Oblast, just north of the city of Blagoveshensk. The commencement of this grand project only awaits the approval of the president himself. Soon enough, the Cosmodrome will be the jumping off point from where the Federation will take its rightful place amongst the vast stars of the cosmos. How? You took this long, and you still cannot win here. Force the attack. You're going to die there, then. Uh, new computer systems. If we were to get close to reaching the vast, untapped potential of the stars, or stars, we will need advanced technological machines and computers that will make this great endeavor to the great beyond much easier and cheaper for the nation. Luckily, we have the greatest minds of the Federation from the scientists of Titan to the brilliant minds of Tomsk making new technological breakthroughs every day. Every day. Soon enough. We shall catch up with the stellar technology of America and Germany, and soon enough, soon we shall soon surpass them as the masters of the stars. Yeah, that's nice. We're doing okay here, so. Per Aspera. Colonel General Matevia Popov watched over the hundred Russian airmen exercising through a one-way mirror. At his side, Maxim Nikitin of Titan Aeronautics, or Aeronautics obsessively scribbled notes under a worn yellow pad. The pair looked down on the airmen like children staring at ants. Then, as all children do, they began to crush the insects. Give me the background of Canada A-8, Popov said. Ace fighters shot down four German bombers during the attack on Moscow, Nikitin said. Disciplinary record shows the charge of insubordination that was dropped after A-8 was awarded for heroism. Almost certainly because of a bribe. Squash A-8, Popov said. D-4 is trailing the others. He was injured in Yarl's level. His leg is still healing. No time for that, Popov said. Squash D-4. Before we squash D-4, we should consider P-R. Nikitin said, we'd need at least one Kazakh. D-4 has served honorably and would make a stellar uh, mission photographer. Popov grunted. We don't have time for this wound to heal. This is a military project. One word to President Shukshin and your bosses are out a couple billion. So, he said, smiling, take a second to think before you bring up PR again. D-4's gone. That you see my way, Popov said. Uh, when these ex exercises are over, I want you to cut the bottom 40% of performers. Overall? Oh, crap. I hope you believe in him, Popov said. We're going, where we're going, we're going to need all the help we can get. F-9 just got off the treadmill. Already squashed. Offer them bonuses to get off the treadmills. Uh, I'm sorry, Nikitin said. Offer 10,000 to the first five to get off the treadmills. Mr. Nikitin, the program is the biggest, uh, most important thing you or I will ever do in our lives. Maybe even more important than the Moscow campaign. Project Zoria needs personnel who can look farther than their wallets. Popov said. More important than Moscow? You can't be serious, General uh, Popov. I am, Papa said. Moscow is a symbol of our heritage. Moscow is the past. The project will define every Russian generation from now until the end of time. And if you put that in a press release, I'm going to kick your butt. Keep it going, keep it going. You on? There you go. Yeah, I'm just sorry. Just like... There's just so extreme amount of reading, which makes sense. I know some of you guys like it, and I like it too, but, like, Jesus Christ. Like, I know we're supposed to wrap up a lot of the story here, but, oh my god. Like, it's almost too much, at least in my opinion. What the hell is taking you so long to move? I know it's mountains, but still, Jesus Christ. Why are you so ungodly slow? Roads, a large river... Uh, infrastructure and lack of fuel. What do you mean you have a lack of fuel? What? The capital's not been cut off yet. Ji Kang? Actually, how much did you get for this one? A casual 176 uh, soft attack, that's all. Carving a giant. It began with the foundation, as all things do. Dozens of men upon do spent dozens of days digging a great tench, trench upon the chosen site. Thus came forth the womb that will bear the fruit of the Russian ingenuity. A great slab of concrete was poured and sheltered from the rain, as any father would shelter their only daughter. At midnight upon the seventh day of the month, as the concrete lay drying, a long soul crept into the poorly secure building site. Fedrek Müller, the last of the scion of the Velimir the Great, offered a prayer to Perun and pressed a severed finger into the drying concrete, a sacrifice for the strength of the Russian people. Then came the bones. Great beams of steel carved from the flesh of mountains laid down upon a plain swept by tools of men a month past, and the spirit of the great mountain mill was outlined by its father. Two months into the beast took shape. Three and the bones knit together into a skeleton. Again, Müller uh, snuck into the launch site and painted a sacrifice of his own blood upon the holy girders, a sacrifice for the hope of all Russians. Next came forth the beast's veins, pipes imported from the factories in Samara, entwined with a skeptic heart. 
Great ducts of flimsy aluminum clumsily pressed together formed the titan's lungs. Wires lay down in a mirror across the vastness of Russia to become a nervous system. By now, the government erected security fences along the half-born creation. Melior dug the under the fences, entered the facility, and smeared his breath, his phlegm, and his bile upon the naked electrical system, a sacrifice that Russian it should be spoken in the heavens. Finally, the labor was complete. A skin of fiberglass and brick stretching over the beast, covering its blessings or blessed organs and completing the facade of normality or normalcy. Yuri, as Frederick was known to his work team, stood silently as an orthodox priest cried false blessings over the Barnell Space Center. His accurate and incense and meaningless utterings billowed over a gathering of every soul that had labored to complete the center, but it was useless. Nothing had hollowed to Perun can be taken from him, not the earth, or its men, or humanity's creation. All of it belonged to him, and so for Perun's glory, and for the glory of the children of Hyperborea, Russia would march into space unopposed. A prayer spoken in the dark is still heard in the heavens. A cosmonaut. Who shall walk distant worlds so unlike our own? Who shall become the legends of the stars who journey the infinite cosmos? Shall it be the American astronaut, the German Sternenmann? No, the traveler of the stars will be a symbol of our own motherland, the courageous cosmonaut. With a new generation of spacesuits designed to protect the wearer from the dangers of space whilst ensuring peak mobility, the cosmonauts of Russia shall become the face of a stellar exploration as the Federation pushes humanity ever onwards towards the future. And by God, you better move your big old fat booty hole over there. Nice, what, 437, 435? Seriously, like, oh my God. I, I'm sorry, I'm sick and tired of these extremely long stories. They're so long. Gentlemen, this is the microprocessor, President, uh, Professor Magnus Onward said, and I've traveled all the way from Uppsala University to demonstrate how it works. He stepped away from his podium and began to walk through the gaps of occupied desk holding what looked to be a tiny ink-black block of metal no thicker than a fingernail. Dozens of Russian scientists, businessmen, and officers stared with a determined focus as he spoke. Specifically, this is a four-phase system, all 8-bit slice chip, designed in 1969 by Lee Boisel. By March of 73, this chip was incorporated into 374 major industrial sites throughout America for the simple fact that it runs faster than a horse on steroids. By November of 73, that design was purchased by the Department of Defense and four phase four phase systems was looked or locked into a permanent ex exclusive contract. By January of 74, the chip design was leaked to the Reich spies in May of that year. The German government had hired myself and three other Swedes to study how microprocessor technology could be incorporated into the future Reich aerospace endeavors, including a potential mission to Mars, he said. He smiled and looked locked eyes with the nearest guard, considering how the war went out. I don't think they'll be heading into space anytime soon. Onward, turned back to his audience, chuckling at his own joke. I've been led to understand that the Federation currently operates its computer systems primarily through integrated circuit technology, he said. A microprocessor belongs to the integrated circuit family, in the same way that Homo sapiens belongs to the hominid family. My team anticipates that fully integrating microprocessor technology into your current electronics information system will result in a 40 to 45 percent efficiency increase in the conduct of Operation Zoria, you see. Yes, yeah, the gentleman in the back. A heavy set bearded man in a horned rim glasses lowered his hand. Yes, this is fascinating. Thank you. I actually worked on a similar project in the Republic of Colmy several years ago, but now involving brain matter rather than a metal circuit, you see, we hypnotized or hypothesized. Yes, thank you, my friend. We'll have plenty of time to discuss past experiments after I finish my presentation, Pre uh, Professor Onward said. Now, in regards to the structure of the microprocessor, don't explain computer to the layman. It's much simpler to explain sex to a virgin. The stars away. There's no more limits for the Russian Federation to face anymore. The Federation has overcome all challenges the world has led to throw at it. We've endured the collapse of the CSR. We've reunified our glorious motherland. We have transformed ourselves from an authoritarian state to one of the freest countries on the planet and have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe against the racket and triumphed. Now that our place in the world has been secured, our people liberated and the preparations made, it's time for the Federation to conquer its next great challenge with that is within reach. The star, the stars, stars. I apologize. I, I'll be honest, like, like, I said, like I said, I've been like... I'm sick and tired of these super, 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 super long events. But also, I'm recording this at like literally one o'clock in the morning, so I apologize. Like, I, I, I run out of time. Like, so if you don't know, like, if I don't upload three videos a day, it's literally because I run out of time. So I apologize, like, to break the immersion and stuff. But like, at one o'clock when I'm recording this, it, it's, it's just, oh my god. Like, I like the stories, I like the events, I love the lore building, but sometimes it's just, it's just a bit too much. Not everything needs a, an extreme story. Sometimes you have stories that continue are very nice, but sometimes I just can't handle it, man. Oh, don't forget all of that of a sock. The cosmonaut and another very. Oh my God, Jesus Christ! This is what I'm talking about, man. This is too much. It's just a bit too much for everything. Maybe cut it down now just a little bit for each one, maybe, or maybe have some really long ones and some other ones. What the hell happened here? 
Well, it looks like I'm going to have to do some glitchy things off screen because this is a bunch of BS. But, cameras flashed and microphones buzzed as Maxim Nikitin strutted before an audience of dozens of journalists. In the very center of the gaggle, Dmitry Morozov of the All Russian Central Broadcasting Group recently renamed the Sibir Central Broadcasting Incorporated. A known conservative, nationalist, and patriot counterbalancing Morozov was Ekaterina Balabanov. A bilingual leftist from the Moscow Herald, beyond the two Russians were inked oysters of every nation, two Americans from the San Francisco Times, representatives of the Ansahai An and Sankai Shimbun, a senior editor of the press and journal, and even a cohort from Oglobo. For Nikitin, or Nikitin, it was uh, heaven. Our nascent space program has been extraordinarily successful, Nikitin said. We project the initial stage of development and infrastructure production will be completed within two months before a schedule behind him. A 50 meter deep pool sh shimmer with danger and obscurability. Our intention is to advance both German and American designs through collaboration with former members of both programs. Did you know? The senior most member of the German spacesuit design team defected to the Federation? Turns out his wife was Polish, he said. The gaggle journalists fiercely scribbled down every detail, the Polish angle. That was a story they could run with. Today we're testing two things. Number one, the integrity and agility of the latest spacesuit models. Number two, the performance of the team members under conditions comparable to microgravity, he said. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a handheld radio. Gentlemen, please begin the test. On the far side of the enormous pool, Eight exalted men and women dove into the crystal depths. Only a single cable, one for each, kept them from falling over to the bottom of their artificial seat. This is mission leader Zetsiev. The radio cracked, beginning our descent at, uh, at time 1423. Nikitin smiles as the journalist leaned forward towards the radio, straining to hear Zetsiev's speech. Proceeding normally, all is well. Sc wait, scratch that, Zetsiev said. Mission leader confirmed the problem, General Popov said hurriedly over the radio. Sir Valentina's suit just sprung a leak at the left shoulder joint. Her suit is beginning to fill with water. I request permission aboard the exercise. Back to the drawing board. Still are. As the president watched on in anticipation from the safety of the control room as the out countdown began. Beside him stood Pokrushkin, who watched on both in curiosity and awe as the numbers slowly began to count down. Three, two, one. The engines roared alive, the ground beneath it white hot as the flames propelled the rocket away from the ground, laying beneath a trail of smoke as it raced for the stars beyond the crystal blue horizon. Shukshin, blurry eyed, looked back on the incredible journey the Federation had taken from a struggling splinter of the CSR to the ones that would reunify Russia. The ones that would avenge 1941, the only country in history to ever triumph over the Wehrmacht, and the ones that would lay the foundation for the tomorrow in the skies. While well, the scientists told the president that the spacecraft had successfully made an orbital insertion and was preparing to make a landing on the Great Luna itself. Shushin no simply nodded. He smiled, stood speechless, and the Federation looked up towards the stars above. Together, as what seemed impossible is now possible, and seemingly endless amount of new possibilities and dreams are now being within reach. No longer a dream. And it says we're done here, but <sighs> I'm, we're not done. I've got to fix this stuff up here, so I'll see you just a well, little everyone, bit. Well, um, everyone, I don't know. They just pieced out, and that's honestly extremely disappointing, just because we got these guys done, we got those guys done, but. Yeah, there's not much else right here. So I apologize for like being ragey about this, or just I'm not even ragey. I'm just frustrated, man. Like, bro, having extremely long stories for everyone kills my intermission. But that might just be me. I know some of you guys really love it, and if you do, I'm glad you do. I'm glad you like it. And thanks for watching. Uh, but like, it's for me, man. Sometimes it's a bit too much. I mean, Hoi Four at the end of the day is still a war game, but I do love a lot of the stories. It's just. It just feels like it just dragged on. It just dragged, 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 dragged on. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. But I still want to see what the mod developers have in store for the other unifiers. But obviously the next episode, we're going to go back and reform the CS CSTO. And hopefully with the other nations that we annexed previously. But regardless, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. Let me know. Do you like how long some of these events are? And how much reading there is let me know if you like it or you don't like it do you agree with me disagree with me i'm open to reading your comments but thanks for watching guys and have a great 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 rest of your day